Greetings, Clark. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom about your book, Learning Sciences. For our audience, would you please give us a little bit of a background about yourself related to learning science? Sure. Um, I saw the connection between computers and learning as an undergraduate. And, and thanks for the opportunity, by the way, Guy. I saw the connection and we didn't have a major, so I, but we did have a way to design your own. I designed my own major and it's been my uh, passion really ever since, as well as my career. And my first job out of college was designing and programming educational computer games. And I realized we didn't know enough and I wanted to know more. So I went back to get a PhD in what was effectively applied cognitive science. It was in cognitive psychology, but that grounding in the cognitive sciences, but I was still curious about learning and I pursued behavioral learning and social learning. I even looked at machine learning. <laughs> what can we do here? And that curiosity has carried me through and you know, I was excited when they formed the learning sciences. Uh, you know, in the 80s, they formed the cognitive sciences because they recognized people in philosophy and linguistics and anthropology and psychology were all looking and thinking. They said they need a way to talk to one another. And then in the 90s, that sort of sparked a similar thing with learning science and, you know, bringing in instructional design and educational psychology and cognitive science together to look at learning and find a way that people weren't doing repeating stuff other people had done in different silos. They now had a way to interchange. And I've just been intrigued by that and tracked that, you know, since then and then before. So you have a number of books related to learning and development and such. Could you give our audience a rundown of uh, what what you've written in the past? Um, sure. Uh, the That early experience with games has been sort of a persistent theme. And so that was actually the topic of my first book was how do you design such? And then I've been involved in mobile kind of through a flute, but I ended up being getting the opportunity to be deeply involved. And so that was the topic of my second book and my third book because the publisher of my second book had a, one of their subsidiaries did the higher ed thing and they asked for a mobile book for higher ed. Then something I had wanted to write was talking, looking at L&D and recognizing it was, you know, sort of last century. <laughs> I thought we need to pull it up, including stuff you talk about, Guy, you know, performance support going beyond just the course. And so I, that, I convinced my publisher to let me put that one out, revolutionize learning and development. And um, I was a wee bit frustrated with my publisher and ATD came to me and, and they co-published the revolutionized book on the suggestion of my editor. And they came to me and asked for the myths book, a book on learning myths that plague our uh, industry. And I, so I wrote one that sort of cat characterized 16 myths and five superstitions and 16 what I term misconceptions about learning that we really need to deal with in effective ways. And then they came back to me for this book, the you know learning science for instructional designers. And um, I, Similarly thought it was a good idea. It's been a passion ever since, you know, came together with uh, Julie Dirks and Will Talheimer and Michael Allen to write the series e-learning manifesto that sort of talked about what we needed and we figured we needed a good reference as well. Well, thank you. So um, can you sh share with us, you know, so who did you write this book for? I've heard you in, a, in another video interview talk about the title, the subtitle, if you will. Um, for who it's for, and you you have some thoughts about maybe it shouldn't have been that. But uh, so who'd you write it for, and what do you hope the takeaways are? Well, so the title you're referring to, it's Learning Science for Instructional Designers. And in retrospect, I regret that. I, I would have been happy with Learning Science for Instructional Design, because there is a job title largely of instructional designers, and these are people who create training and, and design e-learning. And it's definitely targeted to them, but it's about learning science in general. And if you think about it, there are more people who end up designing learning experiences. So, so as coaches, you should be designing stretch assignments for your uh, the people you're coaching, your coaches, I guess. <laughs> and uh, then you should also be good providing them useful feedback. So it should be a learning experience. So you're a learning instructional designer in that sense. And teachers, of course, are instructional designers. And there's evidence that... You know, our education system doesn't have enough uh, background in learning science as well. And even parents, 
um, really should be designing learning experience for their kids. And finally, you know, if you really think about it, at, you know, if you listen to the prognostications that change is happening faster and then we're just going to have multiple careers and need to continue le lifelong learning, then you should be designing your own learning experiences and you really need to understand as well. So, yeah, as, as self-serving as that may sound, I really think everybody should be understanding learning science, at least to a basic degree. Well, because we have a lot of, I'll go slightly further, we have a lot of folk beliefs about what is good learning, and it may be, you know, have been a belief that if it looks like school, it's learning, which we actually know isn't a particularly good thing, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so we really need to make sure that we can distinguish what, you know, a lot of people believe versus what science tells us. Yes, I hope our, our audience, uh, that's one of their takeaways from this, is that uh, it's if you're not an instructional designer, but you're involved in learning in an educational context or an enterprise context, but you're not, don't have that job title, this is a book that you should uh, uh, get and uh, study. I, I think it's very valuable. I'm, I'm glad that you wrote this. Um, can we walk through the chapters of the book? You have eight chapters and, uh, you know, we don't want to cannibalize any sales potential on this, but uh, we would like to give people an idea about what you're covering and however depth you want to go or, or whatever focus you want. But you start off with an introduction to learning science. So can you give us a definition of what the heck is learning science? Well, learning science is a suggestion that formation of the society is an interdisciplinary uh, look at how we learn. And it's, you know, the research that goes into trying to understand what works and what doesn't. So it's, it's a combination of learning and applied learning science to, to instruction. And it's, you know, what, but it's not myths, it's not, you know, beliefs, it's what scientific study has exposed, the theories behind it. And, uh, you know, and as is with all science, you, you create hypotheses, you test them, you see what's true, you create the best theories you can, and you continue to look for their predictions and try and violate, you know, validate or violate your theories about how things work. So chapter two covers from neural to useful. What's that all about? Well, so really as a brief overview of the whole book it's about um, the core of our thinking architecture and then there are lots of artifacts that result from this in this case i've pulled out the ones that are specific to learning so i strongly believe that to really understand learning you have to understand that core information processing cycle from perception attention and working memory trying to get things into long-term memory which is really what learning is about and then how do we perform and obviously it really should be about performance. What can we do after learning experience that we couldn't do before? So that second chapter is specifically that whole information processing cycle. Talk about how the underlying architecture is neural, but that's not the right level at which to design. And so instead we look at that processing cycle and what work, you know, what are the consequences of that architecture, including the limitations that have implications for design. And throughout the book, another thing I've done is I've tried to, after each section or each artifact, capture the learnings you should take away um, for the purposes of design. Yes. So architectural artifacts, what's that? Um, so there are a number of artifacts that come out of our uh, learning and um, this includes things that help us and things that hinder us. So the fact that we need mental models and feedback and the, the requirements for practice, there's a whole bunch of elements that just of all the artifacts of our cognitive architecture, these are the ones that influence learning and the ones we should know about and play a role in our ability to design learning experiences that are effective. And so I know cognitive load and a whole bunch of interesting and important elements that we need to understand. Thank you. Chapter four covers emergent cognition. A lot of the original view, well, we went from the sort of behaviorist view when we started studying scientifically our brain, you know, Ebbinghaus arguably was the first one. And we started taking a scientific approach. 
but behaviorism took over and it sort of said, we can't talk about what's happening in the brain. We can only look at stimulus and response. And after that, the cognitive revolution sort of talked about, we can create uh, hypotheses and we have mechanisms to now identify some of these structures within the brain and what their implications are. But that ended up being a lot like we're formological reasoners and sort of a post-cognitive perspective is that we're not formological reasoners. And you can look at behavioral economics or the writing of you know, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow talks about all these interesting ways in which we differ from formological reasoning. So I tried to capture some of those in, this, in that chapter. So it talks about how our thinking is emergent. It's a combination of our experience in the past and the current context, but it's very contextually determined. And then our, the old view used to be that all our thinking is in our heads. And you know, research has shown that instead, a lot of our thinking is out in the world. We use artifacts like spreadsheets and calculators and tools to handle parts of cognition that our brains can't do well alone. And so we need to understand that and, uh, you know, uh, social as well. It's distributed not only across artifacts, but across people and we work together to solve problems. So I was looking at helping people understand these sort of post-cognitive phenomena that are important and their learning implications. Chapter five is let's get emotional. Yeah, we have also recognized that you know, not being formological reasoners, we're heavily influenced by the impact of emotional aspects of the learning experience. If you're not motivated, it's not particularly what's gonna stick. If you're really highly anxious about the learning experience, it's not gonna be effective. So we need to moderate this. And in some sense, it's really not emotion. That's a handy catchphrase. In cognitive science, we talk about cognitive, affective, and conative. And you know, cognitive is making the learning effective. Um, but an affective is sort of hard to change. It's, it's personality, it's not learning styles. It, ocean is so far the best framework we have. But the conative is your intent to learn. And it's really about how do we help people recognize that they do need this? And what are the influences of positive and negative affect? And it gives us a chance to look at things like humor <laughs> and its influence in learning as well. Excellent. Chapter six, doing meta. Right, learning to learn. Um, and Miriam Nealon and Paul Kirshner in their book, Evidence uh, Informed Learning Design talk about the difference between self-directed and self-regulated learning. So self-directed means take ownership of your own learning and choose what you wanna learn. The self-regulation is the level below that says, now I've chosen to learn this, do I do it effectively? And we want to develop mental learning skills as we develop learners, I argue. Um, this was something I was doing way back with the late Jay Cross. We were worried about mental learning and thinking if organizations don't ensure that their people are effective learners, they're leaving money on the table. It may be the best investment you can. So what about that? What is good self-regulated learning? And this is in particular for people who are gonna continue to self-develop to be aware of what leads to good learning. And so the planning and then monitoring your learning and then evaluating the outcomes not just for the outcomes for the goal of learning, but also reviewing your own practices and continually self-improve. Very important, yes. Chapter seven, implications. Right, um, that's taking what we've done and going back through and taking another cut through it. It's looking at a specific learning experience and unpacking uh, the implications for uh, uh, the flow of learning and then also each of the individual elements so that you know we know for learning uh, what's the role of examples, what are the role of concepts, what's practice, and it goes back and reviews those. And we also know for learning, looking at it from a different perspective helps reactivate it. So it's, it's practicing what it preaches in that sense, but it's also giving specific guidance. That's the chapter you know, that specifically uh, should instructional designers should be paying attention to if they're creating learning experiences. Good guidance, yes. Chapter eight, putting it all together. Again, that's sort of a little bit about process and summing up and going a little bit further. It's, you know, we've been talking largely about pedagogy, not andragogy, pedagogy, but you know, um, that's a whole separate rant. <laughs> Don't need to go there now, but it's really designing learning experience, but I also step back and look at what does that imply for curricula? Because I've, one of my you know, soapbox issues is that 
so much curriculum is content focused. And there's a reason that happens, but it turns out not to be as useful as having a focus on what learners are doing. And so from the same principles, draw that sort of stuff out. And so it's just a wrap up, a way to finalize and put the bigger picture into it and close off the experience. Yes, I like the diagram that you had in the book there about, uh, I guess it was topics and then it went to actions. And so it was about application and learning to apply things rather than just learning things. I, I thought that was interesting. Um, so, and, and then there's in the appendices, there's a, there's a, a, a chapter summary for chapters two through eight. And I thought that was good, a, a good set of uh, reminders of uh, what the takeaways from the book. Can you the share learnings. a little bit about, uh, so where can people get this book? You said it was from ATD, but it's el it's available elsewhere, is it not? Uh, yeah, like everything else, it's available at, Am at Amazon. Um, and uh, in fact, it's interesting, ATD, for the last book, had said, you know, drive them to the ATD site. Now they're saying drive them to the Amazon site <laughs> because they have better metrics and tracking than uh, ATD could possibly do. Uh, and, you know, my marketing editor would think I'm remiss if I don't mention if you write, read it and like it, go write an Amazon review <laughs> for it. Um, but, and, you know, I have on the Quinovation site, so Quinovation is my vehicle for going out there. So, a tab for all my books and there's a page for that specific book and there's a link to go buy it from there. There's also a sample chapter available either th through um, the ATD site or my site. You can download a sample that includes the front matter in the first chapter so you can get a taste for what's there. Well, it's a, uh, I believe the book is uh, just under $22 uh, US dollars. Uh, so it's a uh, both Kindle and the paperback versions, I believe. And uh, so it's, it's it's not very expensive. I think it's well worth our audience uh, following up and, and checking it out, checking out the free chapter on your website, taking a look at some of your other books. Um, but thanks for sharing uh, your wisdom and insights in this book and, and telling us a little bit about it today. Oh, well, thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. I really do think uh, our industry could be more aware of learning science and hopefully this is one channel that may be able to help uh, help us lift our game. Exactly. Thank you so much, Clark. Thank you, Guy.